Hey guys, it's Christina here. I hope you are having a awesome day. Uh, I'm just going to plug in my mic. So give me a few seconds. Yep, that's done. So if you are joining me for this masterclass, um, please say hi. Let me know you're here. If you're watching it on replay, say hi. Let me know you're here. Tell me what you're drinking. Um, and enjoy, enjoy. So this is a masterclass on dental health. Um, I have run this in the naturopathic life membership um, previously and so I thought I would bring it here on the front lines for you guys who have been thinking about is the naturopathic life membership for me is it something that I want to actually attend um, is it worthwhile all of those types of things so I thought I would bring the dental masterclass here in this space so that you can see it and you can have some fun learning some things uh, but also starting to think about dental health from a slightly different perspective than maybe you have learnt about it before. So again, if you're here, say hi, let me know you're here. I'd love to know who's watching live. And as I go through this, if you have any questions about dental health um, or, the or the natural path membership, let me know. I would love to answer them. Hey, Debbie, I can see you're here. Seeing if I can move, there's a little thing in front go away all right so let's get started if you see me looking to the side it's because I'm just checking my slides to make sure that I'm going through all of the things that I want to say to you so when it comes to dental health many of us think about it from the point of view of um, maybe we were kids and we had to go to those school dental vans uh, and the dentist would do whatever they would do so whether it would be getting a filling or just a cleaning or whatever they might have given you a toothbrush uh, they might have told you to floss um, and that may have been the extent of your dental health uh, talk um, for other people they may have had more extensive ones where they've had orthodontics they've had braces they've had all sorts of other things take place like root canals etc 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 so many of us have had different experiences when it's come to dental health. I know for me that as a kid, I was absolutely petrified of the dentist. Uh, and my mum used to have to trick me. So she would make my dental appointments and then send me off to school. None the wiser that I was going to have a dental appointment that day. And then suddenly I would find my name being called over the PA. And I would have to go to the dentist, which probably was helpful in the sense that I didn't have anxiety all day. And... Um, from that perspective, but it was also not so great. <laughs> uh, and I didn't necessarily have great dentists who explained much to me either. So tonight I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about dental health and how it has actually has a really significant role to play in our overall health. So when we think of teeth, we tend to think of these things. Um, we, we think of them as being hard, calcified structures, that are found in our jaw. And we have gone through the period of teething as babies and then losing those baby teeth and then getting our grown up teeth. And then, then we don't get any more teeth unless you get fake ones. Um, so we need to look after them. But we think of them as hard calcifications that are bones that don't really um, do much other than help us to chew our food. But actually they are very important in a whole bunch of roles. So they are, of course, an accessory organ when it comes to digestion. The first thing we do with food is after smelling it and tasting it is we chew it with our teeth. And our teeth do that mastication process, the mechanical breaking down of food so that we can get saliva all over it, which has got enzymes in it. Then it can move into our gut, which has also got more enzymes and acids that are going to break down the molecular structures of the food so we can absorb them because we need food to be in its molecular structure before it enters into our bloodstream and is able to be used by the body for all sorts of different processes. So digestion starts in the mouth and our teeth are a really vital part of that. Um, it is that act of chewing. And we tend to think of teeth as being like stone, hard. They, they don't absorb anything, but actually that's not correct. Teeth are actually porous. Teeth themselves have pores, just like our skin have pores. They're slightly different pores, but we actually start absorbing food and nutrients through our teeth and gums and then into our digestive system. 
So the very beginning process of digestion really does begin in the mouth. Not just as we think though, not just the saliva and the mastication, but actually through our teeth and gums that also are porous and absorb nutrients. So what we put on our teeth is actually important because what we put on our teeth can be absorbed into the teeth and quickly moved into the bloodstream because there's this very close link between our teeth and the bloodstream. Every one of those teeth does have a, every one of those tooths, teeth, I don't know how to say that one properly, um, every one of them has its own blood flow and it has a bloodstream that comes through it and then it gets into the, you know, goes down to the jaw, into the lymphatic system, all of that type of stuff. Every tooth has its own supply of blood and is connected to blood. So therefore what happens in our teeth, what gets absorbed by our teeth can quickly get into our bloodstream. Same with our gums. Our gums have lots of blood flow around them as well. And that also can create uh, a quick transition from mouth to blood flow. Underneath our tongue, for example, we might have medication or supplements or homeopathics where we put, put it under our tongue so it's sublingual. And there under our tongue is another really close receptor to blood flow so we can get um, drops if they're put under our tongue can quickly get into our bloodstream. And again, our mouth is very absorbent. There's all sorts of other things to think about when it comes to our mouth and our dental hygiene, and one of which is the microbial life that lives in there. If we have a good microbiome, then food tastes really good to us, like healthy food tastes good for, to us. But if we have a microbiome that is filled with pathogenic bacteria, what that food can taste like to us is acetone. So food comes on, it might be a carrot, for example, which ordinarily we would think would taste nice, comes into our mouth and because we've got a microbiome that's a little bit funky, what can then happen is that it tastes like acetone, so now a polish remover. It also feels furry uh, and that's where we see kids who may be uh, very selective with food, self-restricting or limiting food options and that can be because the microbiome in the mouth is really out of balance. And if that microbiome in our mouth is out of balance, that's not gonna be a good um, scenario for our teeth as well. <clears throat> so from that dental hygiene point of view, the microbiome of our mouth is super duper important. Another aspect is mouth breathing. And we're gonna go through these things a little bit more succinctly in a moment. But one of the other things that I wanna touch on when it comes to the importance of teeth and dental hygiene in our overall health is that there is a really strong link to our tooth and our teeth hygiene and you know whether we've got cavities, whether we've got root canals, whether we've got any of infections taking place, it's a really strong link between infections in the mouth and heart disease uh, because those infections can get into that blood supply very, very quickly because it's got that close blood connection, it can get into the blood supply very, very quickly and then cause damage in our arteries. And as that happens, what can happen is that the blood vessels or the arteries can become quite thin. So those walls become thin and one of the ways that our body deals with this in its infinite wisdom is to bring plaques in. And those plaques are designed to build up and make the artery wall more solid and firm while the body does the repair of that infection, correcting the problem and fixing it. However, because we tend to not think of our teeth as very important, we delay treatment. We may not go to the doctor or, or the dentist. We may not actually look after our teeth very effectively. Um, there's all sorts of things that we might not do, and one of which is seeking the help of a professional to deal with that infection. And so the infection can continue to fester and it doesn't necessarily get repaired. And then over time, that plaque builds up even higher and higher. And then, of course, that's where we start to see some blockages come about. So when we're looking at heart disease, one of the really important factors to look at as well is the dental hygiene, making sure that there are no uh, infections that are taking place in the teeth or in um, root canals. Root canals are a big culprit for this because there often is uh, infectious cavities underneath those root canals as well. So that's something to look at and something to think about if you have some heart disease in your family 
or you have noticed that you've got high blood pressure or any of those risk factors when it comes to heart disease, check your dental. Check, do you have any root canals? Do they need to be x-rayed and do you maybe need to get them removed? So that's something to think about. And welcome to all those people that are jumping on live with me. If you have any questions about teeth and dentistry while I am on, remember I'm not a dentist, I am a naturopath and I'm talking about it from a natural nutritional perspective of how we can help support uh, our teeth and our body. Um, I, so don't take what I'm saying as the be all and end all. You should definitely always check in with your medical professional and your dentist. Um, but if you have any questions that I can answer, I would happily answer them. Okay, so some of the things that I'm going to focus on tonight is I'm going to talk about Western A. Price, I'm going to talk about modern dentistry, I'm going to talk about biofilms, tooth decay, uh, repairing teeth naturally, nourishing teeth, and then um, definitely go through any questions and answers that you might have. So go ahead and pop any of those questions in, I would love to answer them. Okay, so modern dentistry. Modern dentistry tells us that we need to brush, floss, limit things like sugar, um, not, you know, brush our teeth last thing at the night so that we don't have anything uh, sitting on them, regular dental care um, to keep our, our teeth generally healthy and well. That's the premise that we do all of these things like we brush, we floss, we limit sugar intake, we make sure that we're not leaving food and stuff on our teeth as, for long periods of time uh, and we go and get de regular dental care from a dentist. Um, that is the idea of what we do to help look after our teeth and if that's not uh, effective enough we also might get cleanings, we might get fillings, we might get root canals, we might get braces, we might get surgery, uh, we might have some periodontal care that we utilise as a part of our arsenal in order to keep teeth healthy and well. Interestingly though, dentistry is one of the only medical professions where it is deemed okay to leave a dead organ in a body. So for example, if you had a kidney that was dead, the they would go ahead and operate and remove that. If you had a pancreas or some other organ in your body that was actually dead, they would remove that because essentially what would happen to that dead organ is it's going to rot in your body. And then it's going to become a, it will create a place for infection to take hold. Now, root canals are essentially a way of preserving teeth when they're, they're essentially dead. They preserve them uh, by drilling out the nerve and then fill, backfilling that. But the rest of the tooth there no longer is receiving nourishment from a blood supply because it's already dead. Uh, and so that's just something for us to think about when it comes to uh, root canals and dentistry and how that might actually play out, especially considering what I just said about heart disease. Okay, so one of my favorite people to think about when it comes to dentistry is Western A. Price. Let me know in the comments if you've heard of Western A. Price. I would love to know. So Western A. Price was somebody that I learnt about probably 17 years ago because I started reading about him when I had my first baby and I started to learn about um, nourishing traditions around that time. Yeah, awesome. I'm glad that this is the first time that you've heard about it. Um, definitely something worth looking into, Kayleen. Okay, so Western A. Price, I, I started researching him a good 17 years ago when I first had my first baby and I started to look into uh, natural health and look into how we can help ourselves and learning about nourishing traditions and all of that type of stuff. So Western A. Price essentially was a dentist in the 1900s uh, and you know he was, he was quite famous in the sense that he was the chairman for the National Dental Association. So from 1914 to 1923, he was the chairman um, of the National Dental Association. Uh, and he was the pioneer for the American Dental Association, so ADA. So he wasn't just some random guy that, you know, thought up these thoughts when it came to dentistry. He actually had some significant investments in the field of dentistry. And so he had this idea that if modern dentistry says that we need to brush our teeth, floss our teeth, um, you know, not eat sugar, um, get regular dental checkups, maybe do some cleaning, have some feelings when necessary, all of that type of stuff in order to have good healthy teeth, 
I should theoretically be able to go somewhere where they can't access any of that. And what I should see is people with really poor dental health. Well, I should see lots of cavities. I should see lots of people in pain with teeth. I should see people with lots of teeth missing. I should see all of these things. So he found some really interesting places where they were still living their traditional ways. They hadn't been um, subjected to kind of the Western way of eating. They hadn't, you know, been along the trading lines where they got things that um, weren't in their natural diet. So he went and found these people and he started to investigate them and started to find out what's happening for them. And he got a real shock. He got this shock because he thought what he would see is a lot of dental problems. And what he saw was actually the opposite. What he saw was a lot of people with really broad jaws. So they had no overcrowding because they had plenty of room in their jaw to take all of the teeth that they were meant to have. He also noticed that they had this big they had slime covering their teeth, but apart from that, there was not a lot of cavities. Most people, in fact, didn't have a cavity, and the most things that he saw when people had dental problems was based on injury. Like somebody had punched them, of course, and you know they'd lost a tooth, or they'd had some damage from an accident. That was mostly what he saw, as opposed to what he saw in the Western world, where lots of people had cavities, they needed root canals, they needed teeth extractions, they had overcrowding. What he saw was actually the complete opposite and it was a real surprise for him that that's what he saw because he, of course he was expecting the opposite to take place. He was expecting to see a lot of dental problems and that's not what he saw. And so of course he started to investigate and wondered why, why was he seeing this? Why was it so different? And then, you know, he spent many, many years of his life really investigating and really digging into these cultures and asking, what are they eating? How are they eating it? Um, what are they doing that's different to what we're doing in the West? And of course, that's the birthplace of things like nourishing traditions, where we look at not only did they eat their own traditional foods, but they prepared them properly. They prepared them in the ways that they had been traditionally prepared. And so we in the West often do shortcuts. <laughs> So when we think about bread in the supermarket, bread traditionally was always made with a multiple different grains. So we might have had wheat for a couple of months. We might have had rye. We might have had barley. We might have had kumut. We might have had spelt. We might have had a whole range of different wheats to make bread with. And then bread was made always from a sourdough version. So whether it be a short or a long process, it always had some souring. So whether it was fermented in the field where the wheat was cut and left to for the dew to come up and actually start to activate the seeds and then the sun would come and dry them which would be that sprouting process that we might do um, and then they would thresh it and then of course they would make their own sourdough starter and then they would use that as their form of bread and so in that process what happens is the phytic acid that's naturally found in all nuts and seeds was neutralized and now they didn't necessarily know that they didn't necessarily know that there was phytic acid in the grains and that the reason that they did it the way that they did it was to neutralize those they just knew that that's how we make it and that's how they used yeast so they would harvest wild yeast from the air with the flour and then that would make their bread rise. Now, that's a very different bread to what we would get in our supermarkets that's got a lot of other things added to it, like sugar, as well as stabilizers and emulsifiers, uh, as well as a yeast, which is not a naturally caught yeast. It's a yeast extract that has been designed to grow really fast. And then of course, not need that long rising time that a sourdough would have. So it's all very interesting to start to look at not only was the way that they ate differently, but also the way that they prepared the food. And they did a lot of these really natural things like that fermentation or the soaking and souring of stuff. They also ate a lot of fermented foods, so they would eat a lot of krauts. Now, every culture has got its own fermented foods that, that it consumes, uh, and there's a plethora of them. But each culture still had many of their own 
traditional fermented foods that they would consume. Uh, and so he noticed that they were eating those fermented foods. He also then noticed that they would eat a lot of soups and stews and broths and they would use all the parts of the animal. So once they had extracted the meat off the animal, that animal would then go into a pot to also be boiled so that they could get all the beautiful nutrients out of that bone broth. Uh, and that would be a part of their diet really regularly as well. And so there was lots of these things that he noticed as he was spending time with these cultures. And so from that perspective he then started to think hmm if this is what's happening i wonder what would happen if we started to bring those traditions back if we started to utilize that in our western world and of course he and sally fallon and a few other people now have written books that is based on that knowledge that he has taken away and from that, of course, converted it into some dietary protocols. There's now a whole institute that is um, there in order to help teach people about some of the things that Western A. Price found, but now also the research into the future of what's actually happening with our food. So when it comes to five, when it comes to dental problems, there are five basic reasons and of course there can always be some more but these are the really basic ones that most people have and I can see some of those questions have come through I'm going to jump back and answer them in a minute um, so hold hold on tight I'll definitely get back to answering those questions okay so the five basic um, causes of dental problems tend to be lack of minerals so lack of minerals can happen in a whole bunch of different ways. So the food that we're currently eating now can have less minerals than what it did previously. And some of that has to do with our farming practices, the way that we farm food now. So traditionally what would happen when we didn't have agricultural systems like we do now with water, etc., we would plant our crops near riverbanks so that we could harvest the water and put that onto our crop and our crop would grow. In that water would be lots of minerals, but then also as the crop grew over a period of years, what would happen approximately every seven years would be that the river would flood. And as the river flooded, it would bring those minerals from the bottom of the river and plant them back onto that fertile soil around the riverbanks. Now, of course, we don't farm like that anymore. We now use you know big open plains and we use irrigation systems to water our crops uh, and we put only a few nutrients back into that soil in order to grow plumper faster more not necessarily delicious but bigger um, and more appealing aesthetically crops so we we, we put basically four major nutrients back into the soil when there are over 99 or more nutrients that need to go into that soil in order to make it healthy and well along with probiotics and all sorts of other things so you can imagine because we don't have that flooding of the riverbank we don't grow by the riverbank anymore that we're also starting to miss some of the minerals as well as you know there's a whole bunch of things and i'm being very generalistic here uh, there are a whole bunch of other things like the way that we treat the soil, how we over farm it. We don't necessarily let rest happen. We do monocultures. We do all of these different things that have reduced the amount of minerals that are now available in our soil that then is also less available to get into the food that we're growing in that soil. So that's one of the problems, that lack of minerals. Another one is a lack of soluble vitamins, which is, again, created by the same scenario that the soils that we are growing our food in conventionally isn't necessarily um, being replenished. So it's not necessarily being fed well. It's not looked after in that sense of creating good quality soil that has lots of diversity in it, that has a rich microbial life in it, that is going to actually help those plants grow strong and robust and packed full of nutrients. The other thing that causes dental problems is too much phytic acid in the diet. And so just as I mentioned with the sourdoughing process, phytic acid is in all seeds and grains. Uh, and so when it comes to phytic acid, we want to neutralize that in order to be able to get the nutrients out of that plant. But phytic acid itself is an anti-nutrient. So not only does it not give you nutrition, it takes nutrition from you. So in order for you to get rid of the food that you're eating, it's taking the nutrition from your body 
in order to get rid of it and you've not received anything out of it. And when we think about wheat, and I'm just going to pick on this particular grain, when we think about wheat or cereals, when I'm doing a food protocol or a, I'm asking one of my patients or clients about what they're actually eating, often what I'll find is that they're eating um, a lot of cereal for breakfast. It could be toast. It could be a box of cereal. It could be some other type of grain like oats, etc. that they're eating. And then at lunch, they're having a sandwich and they might have some salad with that or they might just have something like peanut butter on it or jam or any of those types of spreads. And then they might have a muesli bar with that and then they might have some crackers with that. And then at dinner, they might then also have some bread with their dinner or they might have something else that's containing some grains as well. So if we're looking at their diet, we're looking at what else have they eaten? Have they eaten vegetables with their breakfast and protein with their breakfast? Have they eaten those with their lunch and have they eaten those with their dinner? What we're actually seeing is sometimes some of my clients come in and all they've eaten for the day is wheat in its many different forms. So they might have had wheat bix for breakfast with some milk and then lunch they've had, um, you know, a sandwich that's had some jam spread on it. Uh, and then they've had some biscuits. So again, wheat, wheat, wheat. And then again, for dinner, they've had some more. And they may have even had some snacks in between. And so if we're utilizing grains that haven't been soaked or sprouted, we're also getting a lot of that phytic acid. Now, remember a second ago, I just said, phytic acid is an anti-nutrient. It blocks the absorption of any nutrients in that food and it takes nutrients from your body in order to digest it and remove it from the from the actual system. And so phytic acid can be one that is considerably affecting dental health when it comes to making sure that you've got good good health in your in your teeth and your oral hygiene. Uh, another one, of course, is the overconsumption of sugar. And we all probably know this. If you're having too much sugar in your diet and you're consuming quite a bit of it, then the likelihood is you're going to get some dental carriers. Uh, another one that I want to mention is um, the microbial life. So making sure the microbiome in your mouth is actually really well balanced. That's a big one for uh, a lot of people. And I'm seeing more and more of it, which really relates to this last one that I want to point out, which is airflow. So if you are a mouth breather or if you have family members who are mouth breathers, if when they're sleeping, they're not breathing through their nose and instead breathing through their mouth, what's actually happening is that their teeth and their mouth are being exposed to oxygen all the time. So if you think about it, when you're a nose breather at night, what happens to nose breathe? In order to be able to nose breathe, your tongue sits on the roof of your mouth, creating a seal. So that seal then stops oxygen coming and um, being around the teeth. Now that then means that there's less ox oxygen being exposed to your teeth, which changes and alters the microbiome. So if you're a mouth breather, you've got lots of oxygen that's being exposed to those teeth, that creates a conducive environment for pathogenic bacteria to grow and thrive. If you're a nose breather, you're less likely to experience that. Now, there are some conditions and genetic mutations that make you more prone to mouth breathing than others. So MTHFR, of course, is one of those genetic mutations that changes and often alters the, the shape of the palate, which then means that a lot of people who have that don't actually put their tongue at the top of their mouth or the roof of their mouth. And so therefore their teeth are being exposed to that oxygen. And so often what I find in my clinical practice is that a lot of my clients with MTHFR also have to have um, extensive dentistry work done. They may need to work with a myotherapist. They may need to work with a craniosacral therapist. Um, some of them have ear, nose and throat problems because the palate is shaped differently and they need some support with that. Um, but it definitely contributes to poor dental um poor dental hygiene in the sense that not that they're not brushing their teeth but they've got lots of pathogenic bacteria that are starting to grow um, and there's again all sorts of reasons for that as well okay so the nutrients that are important for great teeth are vitamin a d e k 
calcium, magnesium, phosphorus, and trace minerals. So right next to me, I have this beautiful bottle of colloidal minerals from Cindy O'Meara's Changing Habits. Uh, this is one of my favorite ways to get minerals back into the diet. You just simply um, open the top and put use a capful in a good couple of like a big water bottle, get a cap full into there, and that's going to help to remineralize your body. Another thing that's going to help to remineralize your body is things like good quality salt. And I recommend that you actually mix up your salt so that you don't just stick with one salt. So you might have used the pink Himalayan salt and that's the salt that you use. It's a good idea to change it up so that you've got a little bit of sea salt, that you've got a little bit of Celtic salt, that you've got a little bit of the pink salt, that you've got a little bit of some gray salt, that you've got a little bit of Murray River salt. Because each of those salts have a different nutritional makeup. They have different trace elements in them. And the more trace elements you can get in, the better your body has the opportunity to, to get what it actually needs. And so if, when it comes to salt, that's another way to remineralize your body, utilizing a lot of those different ones. Uh, utilizing things like bone broth. Bone broth, again, is another really beautiful way of actually uh, increasing the minerals that you are exposed to, but also a particular nutrient called calcium fluoride. Now, there's a lot of concern about fluoride when it comes to teeth. And of course, fluoride from your water is not something you actually want to be having in there. You don't actually want to have that because that comes from the smokestacks in China. Uh, and here's some of the confusion when it came, comes to calcium fluoride and fluoride. The confusion comes that the original data when people were starting to look into fluoride as a nutrient for teeth came from the research done on bone broth and the calcium fluoride that you would find in bone broth. And so that research, of course, said that this is really protective of your teeth. It's really good at building up teeth and bone quality. It's really good at doing all this stuff. And so what happened was that the calcium was dropped from the name of the fluoride and we went just with fluoride. And fluoride is in itself a different thing and can come from a can come from different um, chemical makeups and different groups. Calcium fluoride is actually one of those ones that's found in, in broth. And so, of course, we want to not drink the one that's in the water. We want to remove that from our water system. We want to avoid toothpaste that has that in there. Uh, and we want to consciously be consuming more of that bone broth that's going to have that calcium fluoride in it. Um, other things that contain calcium fluoride are things like... Um, Purple cabbage. Purple cabbage uh, contains quite a lot of calcium fluoride in it as well. Uh, and so when um, I have clients who are vegetarian or vegan, they need to eat a lot of that. Um, there are some other sources as well, like celery is another good source, but none of them actually really fully match up to the amount that you would get in bone broth. Uh, and so that's something to think about as well. All right, hopefully you're all following along with me and you're finding lots of useful things out of this. The other thing that we need to talk about for dentistry is biofilms. So biofilms are essentially bacteria that have gotten together and decided that they're better off working together than working separately. And so they come together and work as a team. And in that team, they create what is known as an extracellular matrix, which is essentially like this little force field that they create from stealing your minerals uh, and create this little force field. And they live inside of this, this place doing the things that, you know, bacteria and stuff do. Uh, and they're protected, which means that if you put an antibiotic on one of these uh, biofilms, it essentially doesn't penetrate the force field. And so they're happily safe inside uh, and, you know, living, living out their lives the way that they want to live them out. And you've still got this infection, that, which is taking place. So that's the, the, the essentials when it comes to a biofilm and a biofilm can happen anywhere in our body, um, but they definitely happen in our mouth. And we would see them in our mouth when we see things like plaque buildup. Uh, that plaque buildup is essentially a biofilm that has been created. And there are a couple of things that we want to do in order to break down that extracellular matrix in order to be able to get rid of the bacteria that are thriving underneath of that. Uh, and one, some of those things are DE, so dimetaceous earth, depends on who you're talking to. Some people will say 
tumultuous earth but dimetaceous earth uh, is one of those things that you can use to help break down that extracellular matrix um, then you want to make sure that you're getting rid of the bacteria so uh, echinacea in a tincture form can be really useful for that as well uh, and i'm going to talk more about that tomorrow night when i do a herbal spotlight on echinacea so when it comes to healing cavities in our teeth there are lots of people that say you can't do it there are also other people who say that you can so from those people who say that you can do it here are some of the things that they uh, recommend are really important when it comes to remineralizing teeth uh, one of which is of course remove sugar like remove sugar especially um, dietary sugar but you also want to be careful when it comes to fruits and um, honey as well so when you're in that process of trying to do the remineralization you want to be mindful of how much fruit are you having maybe limit it to two portions a day uh, and how much honey you're having as well because those are of course going to feed those pathogenic bacteria we also want to remove all of the processed food so if it comes in a box don't eat it being better off eating the box because it's probably got more nutrition in it than what's in the box. Uh, limiting our phytic acid rich food. So that means uh, all nuts and seeds and grains should be either soaked, uh, fermented or not consumed in that healing process. So if you wanted to have rice, again, you should soak that overnight because it's a grain and it's going to contain some phytic acid before you cook it and then eat it. The same when it comes to wheat, the same when it comes to any of those nuts and seeds. There are some really great little um, profiles on how long you should soak each nut for um, in order to get rid of or neutralize the phytic acid in that. Um, the consumption of fermented or raw dairy. So for me, we don't have access to raw dairy, but we do have access to making our own things like milk, kefir and homemade yogurt, which has been properly fermented for a good uh, 24 hours to make sure that it is lower in um, the carbohydrates or the sugars, the lactose that are found in those products. Um, that fermented dairy is actually really good when it comes to absorbing calcium so of course there are a lot of people that will tell you that uh, cow's milk is low in calcium and when it is in the way that we have it yeah it is because we can't actually absorb it so when we're buying it from the supermarket and it's already being processed what we've done is killed <clears throat> we've killed the enzymes in there that actually help us to digest that milk so unless you've got a raw unless you've got a cow or access to raw milk um, the best form of dairy should be in that fermented process where we've put in those probiotics we've rebuilt up the enzymes in it so that we can actually get the nutrients out of that dairy uh, animal foods like bone broth one of the things that i notice for people who are trying to remineralize their teeth when they come to me and they say i've done absolutely anything everything uh, one of the things that i notice is that they're not consuming organ meats and so liver is one of the really beautiful organs that actually helps us to remineralize our teeth because when we think about our body it has this beautiful logic to it and it will always give to the hierarchy of needs when it comes to teeth or when it comes to the, anything in the body it gives to the hierarchy of needs so vital for life accessory organ <laughs> anything else so vital for life is our heart our heart needs quite a bit of calcium in order for it to continue that pumping action and so it's always going to give the calcium potassium the phosphorus the magnesium it's going to give those nutrients to the heart first and then what's left over gets to go to the bones and then the teeth uh, and so if we're also experiencing cavities and loss of teeth and loss of bone what we're also seeing is that we have a lack of those nutrients in our body. And so when we consume animal heart, we are actually consuming a very, very rich, minerally rich organ. It has all of the nutrients that our own hearts actually need in order for it to flourish. Uh, and so liver is another one of those. Fish and eggs are also another great sources uh, in order to help rebuild and remineralize teeth. Milk kefir is one of my favorites. And of course, let me just grab it. I keep, keep some things here. Um, so when I'm working with clients and we're aiming to help build up their bone density, especially when it comes to teeth, as well as osteoporosis and uh, arthritic or arthritic conditions, so what we do is actually pair milk kefir with calcium carbonate. Let me see if I can get it there. 
Um, so we pair these together so that they take their calcium carbonate with their milk kefir, which has demonstrated in some research studies to increase bone density. And I can say within my own clients, when we've done previous bone density scans, they've done the treatment and they've had extra other scans after that, we can see that there's an increase in their bone density. Uh, so milk kefir, milk kefir cheese, good quality fermented dairy. So when we're looking at cheeses, we're looking at ones that have been fermented uh, and have a, a microbial use in them. So mozzarella, for example, is a heated cheese and it doesn't have any, any living microbes in it, whereas the other cheeses um, do. Uh, Grass-fed butter. Grass-fed butter has um, lots of beautiful nutrients in it that are really fantastic at helping us to detox, helping our brains to grow, helping us to actually rebuild uh, and bring in a lot of the nutrients that are fat soluble in our diet. Uh, vitamin D, so of course sunshine, getting outside for 15 minutes a day, letting as much sun actually hit your body as possible is another beautiful way of bringing in that vitamin D. Uh, sometimes we do need some supplementation for that and I recommend that you check in with a practitioner before you just start taking something. Um, we can also consume some of those fats that have that vitamin D in it. So EPAs, um, essential fatty acids, will have some level of vitamin D. Uh, pigs that have been free-ranged actually also have a really high level of vitamin D in their fat as well. So that's another good source of that. Uh, healthy fats, so coconut oil, avocados, olives, uh, fish, olive oil, fermented cod liver is another beautiful nutrient for when it comes to focusing on teeth and dental hygiene. Um, souring, soaking and sprouting grains and nuts and seeds so that we make sure that we've gotten rid of that phytic acid or we've reduced it so that we can actually get the nutrients out of it. So if you were to go on to Google right now and you would type in what nutrients are found in wheat, it would come up with a list of um, different nutrients that might be found in wheat. Now those nutrients that are listed there are only available to you if you get rid of the phytic acid, which is the anti-nutrient that blocks the absorption of those nutrients. Uh, so it's really important that if we're going to consume those foods that we're actually fermenting them, soaking them, sprouting them so that we can get the nutrients out of them. Uh, number nine on my list is consume leafy green veggies uh, and fermented veggies. So fermented vegetables, um, for me, I think about fermented vegetables as vegetables on steroids. So if you've ever made a fermented salsa, um, it takes the flavor profile to the next level. It is amazing how flavor packed a fermented salsa is compared to just a normal salsa. Uh, and the reason that that flavor is enhanced is because the nutrient profile is also enhanced as well. So just a simple comparison, uh, one tablespoon of cabbage contains approximately 50 milligrams of vitamin C. That one tablespoon of cabbage, when it's fermented, can turn into 500 milligrams of vitamin C. So it exponentially improves the bioavailability of the nutrients that are found in the plants. Uh, and so it's really worthwhile getting into fermented foods if you're not already. Um, using a remineralizing toothpaste, and there are some on the market. Um, I previously made up a recipe for myself that we were using at home. Now I have a good friend named Karen uh, who runs Zach Oli Organic, who makes that toothpaste plus a couple of extra things. Um, so I, I use hers now. I just go buy her, hers instead of making it myself. But you can definitely find some really good toothpaste recipes online if you want to make it at home. Uh, number 11 on my list is oil pulling. So oil pulling is where you would use something like coconut oil. You would put some of that in your mouth and swoosh it around. So if you're in a cold climate like me, you take it solid, let it melt, swoosh it around, let it quote, coat all your teeth and your tongue and your mouth and like really swoosh it around there and hold it in for a good 10 minutes or so uh, and then spit it out. You want to spit that out into the bin, not your sink though, because it can harden and block up your sink. Uh, what's actually happening when you do that is again, remembering your teeth are porous and your gums are also porous as well. So they absorb nutrients. Anywhere we can absorb nutrients, we can also detoxify out of. And so our teeth have the ability to detox out of, our gums have the ability to detox out of as well. Uh, and add minerals back into your diet. And just like I said, you know, 
the changing habit colloidal minerals there are a couple of other colloidal minerals out there as well utilizing different salts can be really useful in actually bringing those minerals back into your diet okay so I've got a recipe here. I might take a screenshot and add my um, homemade mineralizing toothpaste recipe in here for you. If you're in the membership, you have a copy of the slides of this whole thing. So uh, you get to go through them over and over again. Uh, so I'm going to go back through and look at the questions. Thanks, people, for popping them in here. And it's so nice to see so many of you have stuck around. Okay, so, yeah, BP and root canal so if you haven't heard that there's some really great research out there about that if you want to look it up go for it uh, Sarah is saying can root canals be avoided not in the preventative sense um, so root canals by the time you go to a dentist and he's saying you need a root canal I would probably check with another dentist before you go down the pathway of saying yay or nay to a root canal um, other than that there isn't there isn't a lot, lot of great alternatives to a root canal other than getting the tooth extracted and there are some um, new methods of giving you a fake tooth um, which is probably a better option than keeping a root canal um, but it depends again where the tooth is so if the tooth was at the front of the mouth of course you're going to want to replace that with something whether it be a denture whether it be um, an actual implant um, I would probably recommend avoiding titanium implants. Um, there are some other options on the market. You really want to investigate it before you go down that pathway as much as you possibly can uh, because it can cause quite significant trauma to your mouth as well as, of course, provide a space for infection. And again, as I said at the beginning, that infection can lead to thinning of the blood vessels, which then leads to plaque buildup, which then could lead to a heart attack. Um, so that's just something to think about. Uh, Fiona, you've read about Western Aim Price in Dr. Stephen Lynn's book. Awesome. Um, yeah, I can see Belinda is messaging back about the root canals. Um, yeah, you really want to avoid them as much as you possibly can. Um, once the tooth is dead, though, like if you're at the point where the dentist is saying the tooth is actually dead, at that point, you're not going to be able to bring that tooth back to life. Like it's it's dead. It's now starting to decompose in your mouth and it's you're not going to be able to remineralize and bring it back to life. So unfortunately, your options become more limited as you go on. Yay, getting back to basics. Hey, Heather, nice to see you here. Uh, just switched on accidentally to live, going to bed early. Enjoy your early night. Uh, Kayleen, I'm thinking of having caps on my teeth to improve my smile. Do you know of any issues with that? Um, so when it comes to caps, I have some because I got one when I was, that tooth there is a really baby tooth that actually never formed into a real tooth. Um, so I do have one cap before I even really started to think about dentistry and, and think about the impact of teeth um, or dental work on my actual mouth before I started to think about those things um I had had that done um it's less problematic than it would be to get a filling done so from that perspective I would I would investigate what are the products that they're actually using because remember teeth are porous and you will absorb um what they're actually utilizing on there so <laughs> It's a hard one. You've got to ask that question yourself about what you're willing to do and what you're willing to put yourself through. But also I would recommend do so, do a lot of investigation. And if you can go and speak to a holistic dentist about it, go do that because they're going to be the people that will be able to provide you with the best information around what's going to happen when you use those caps. Uh, Angela is saying, I've seen charts with links, each teeth um, to an organ. Absolutely. So if somebody removes a tooth, does it mean that they give, they need to give extra TLC? To, yes, absolutely. Um, they do need to give extra TLC to that organ as well. Uh, and again, there is strong links between all of our body. Remember, we are a intertwining organism. We aren't just this part plus this part. We are interconnected and every part of our body interconnects with another part of our body. And so as we make changes to our body in the way of teeth and dentistry and so on, we also make changes to the different organs 
organ areas. And ultimately, from my perspective, the goal is to fill up as much of your nutritional profile profile as possible and eat real food and eat it in the way that it needs to be eaten in order to be able to receive the nutrients from it. Um, no, I haven't haven't mentioned that yet, Angela, anyway, so it was a good point to bring up. Um, there are lots of other things about teeth that we want to think of as well. So we want to think about fillings. When it comes to fillings, many of us have had as kids mercury fillings put in. Uh, I definitely have a couple that I still want to get removed. Uh, and remembering that in some studies we've seen that when mercury is exposed to heat, to cold, to motion, that it actually is off-gassing mercury into our mouth and we then breathe that in. So that is something that's worthwhile investigating if you have mercury fillings uh, because you will be absorbing some of that mercury into your bloodstream and into your body as well. Uh, I don't recommend you just go get them out without any pre-care. So when I'm working with my patients and they want to get their teeth removed, we do some pre-care. And then once they've had their teeth removed, we do a lot of work to help them remove safely excess mercury from their body uh, and so we really support them nutritionally through that process but it's well worth doing gut work before you go down that pathway so that your body is working really well when it comes to detoxification so once you've had them out you're actually then also supporting your body on the other side so that you essentially don't get sicker than if you had just left them alone uh, so I wouldn't say just go get them out. Make sure that you get some nutritional support if you're actually going to, to get them out. Um, there are all sorts of other things that happen when it comes to dentistry as well. These are just some of the really major ones to think about. So, if, you know, if I was to give you my top tips for looking after your teeth, it would, of course, include um, periodontal care. So if you have some receding gums, then you're also going to be wanting to use some CoQ10. And again, check in with your practitioner about how much would be appropriate for you and if that would be appropriate because CoQ10 does thin your blood. So if you're on medication, you don't want to take high doses of it. Uh, and of course, in this platform here, I can't give you the specifics um, because, of course, that could be potentially dangerous. But if you were in one of my free sessions or you're one of my patients, um, I could give you the specifics about what you would need to use. Now, CoQ10 would be one of those things that I would use. But my top tips, remineralizing your teeth, make sure that you've got minerals in your diet, especially if you're using a reverse osmosis filter. If you're using a reverse osmosis filter, then the likelihood is that you're also going to get low minerals because water is meant to have minerals in it. And that reverse osmosis cleans the water of everything. And so in order for that water to now be nourishing for you again, you want to put the minerals back into the water. So again, that so that it's coming through that system as well. Um, so adding minerals back into your diet, making sure you're consuming things like broth in order to be able to get some of that beautiful calcium fluoride out of your out of your broth. Uh, if you are not going to consume broth, then you might want to look at taking a um, tissue salt that is made up of calcium floor or cow floor uh, in order to start lifting that nutrient for you. Um, you also might want to be consuming some vegetables that are particularly good when it comes to calcium fluoride. Um, celery is one of those, cabbage is one of those, red cabbage in particular. Um, and there are a few others around, but they, they don't have as much as what you're going to get if you actually start consuming regularly bone broth from really healthy animals. Uh, organ meats is another beautiful one. Fermented foods, soaking and sprouting, and then looking at making sure that you're absorbing your nutrients, that you're providing yourself with things like vitamin D, good quality um, fermented dairy. If you have a problem with dairy, then that's an indication that there might be some leaky gut that needs to be repaired as well. And remember, our body is synergetic. So it works together. Everything intertwines with another part of the body. It's not a single this plus this plus this makes up our body. It's this intertwining action that is this beautiful dance between the nutritional health of our body, the emotional well-being and our physical well-being. All of it mixes in together and it actually creates the outcomes that we want to have when it comes to looking after our bodies and dentistry is just another extension of that and so remembering if we are looking after all the parts of us then the likelihood is that we're going to have less problems uh, and 
the same as if we start to fill up those nutritional stores, the likelihood is we're going to have less problems as well. All right, that's it for me tonight. This is the type of stuff that you get once a month in one of our masterclasses in the uh, Natural Path membership, uh, where I get to teach you all this stuff. And I get to say a little bit more in there because you are considered one of my clients in that space. Uh, and it's a little bit more of a safer space where anyone could jump on here. Only those people who are in the room can actually jump into uh, those those masterclasses. Tomorrow, I'm going to be showing you a little bit more. I'm going to be talking about echinacea and doing a herbal spotlight on echinacea. Then uh, the day after, which is Tuesday, I'm going to be doing an activation, so a mindset activation, and I'm going to be talking about anger. Uh, and then on Wednesday, I'm having a live Zoom call. So if you're listening to this and you go, oh, I would like to ask her a few more questions about this topic or about something else around your health, you're welcome to register for that call and jump on live and ask your question with me. It won't be on this platform. It'll just be between you, me, and anybody else who happens to show up for that session. Uh, so take advantage of that opportunity to just come and ask me anything you like, uh, and I'll happily answer that for you. So this is just a really quick snapshot of what happens in the Natural Path membership. Once a week, I teach a lesson. So the first lesson of the month is generally a masterclass on a particular health ailment. So it might be the gallbladder, it might be um, gut health, it might be any, any topic that is imperative or important to us. Then we're going to do a nutritional spotlight. So it's either a herb or a nutrient. And then we do a mindset activation. And then we every month we have a live session where you can jump on and ask me any questions that you like about your own health, your family's health, or anything that we're actually learning about. Uh, so that's it for me tonight. I hope you have the most amazing night ever. And I'll catch you tomorrow for the nutritional spotlight on echinacea. And I look forward to chatting to you soon. Bye for now. See you tomorrow.